Good evening, Kindred. I am Tarans, and welcome back to more Vampire the Masquerade Coteries of New York. I was about to say Bloodlines, but that is a different game. Anyway, uh, last time I did a favor for Sophie and worked on helping Tamika, and I just hit the rest button and this came up, so... You're walking down the street towards your haven. In some other town, the sidewalks would be deserted this time of night. In NYC, there are plenty of passerbys going about their business. It's easy to be paranoid when you're a vampire surrounded by a crowd of humans. The kindred have... The kindred have many enemies, and all those enemies have one trait in common. They're invisible indistinguishable from normal humanity they're invisible indistinguishable from normal humanity other vampires hunters all look like people is that old man just a tired restaurant worker or a kindred thrall telling your movements are the officers waiting in a patrol car ordinary cops or second inquisition specialists looking to end undead threats This kind of thinking leads to madness, but you can't shake the feeling that someone is watching you. It's not the first time you felt like this. Whatever it is, it's probably something you'll have to take care of. Best case, someone is tailing you. Worst case, you'll be attacked and killed. Unfortunately, being undead has its limitations. The sun is coming up soon, and you'll burn to a crisp if you stay on the streets. You reach your haven and settle in for the day, disconcerted by the idea that someone might know where you sleep. As you wake from your slumber and emerge from your haven for the night, you notice a familiar face on the other side of the street, standing on a corner and looking straight at you. It's Kaiser's lackey whom you met recently, Jack. He nods to you, encouraging you to approach. He still looks kind of rough after your last brawl, but the damage to his face has clearly mended. His hands are out of his pockets, though. A sign of goodwill? That's close enough. Let me guess, this is not a social visit. Kaiser sent you? Don't say his name aloud, idiot. He takes a look around. That I feel like should have been done as like a separate dialogue box because it should. Because with how I'm doing this, it should be. He takes a look around just to make sure nobody's listening in on your conversation. Yeah, he sent me. I'm supposed to give you this. He produces a crumpled piece of paper from his jacket pocket and hands it to you. Read it, memorize it, then give it back here. It's a letter. The paper might just be a page ripped out of a spiral notebook, but the writing on it is exquisitely detailed and deliberate. It reads... Time to square your debt with me. Go to the wine shop at 232 Mulberry Street and ask for the... 1821 Special Reserve Donatello Negro Amaro. I have no idea what that is, and when they tell you they don't have it, you say you are uh, something. Those exact fucking words and make sure you get the G right. Del Servitor della Familia G. You'll get a bottle. Just take it and leave it. Just take it and leave by saying grazie. Don't ask how much it is or anything else. Just walk out. When you have it, come back to Jackie Boy here and let him know. Be done. Memorize that shit and hand it over.
<laughs> Didn't peg your boss for a letter kind of guy. Isn't electronic communication his whole shtick? Yeah, well, some things are better done the old-fashioned way. You about done with the letter? You note the phrases and address mentioned in the letter, then hand it back to Jackie. Immediately reaches for a lighter and burns the lighter, putting out the ashes with his boot. So yeah, when you do what the boss asks, come back here so I can tell you where to go next. I'll be in the alley over there, so find me when you have the item, whatever it is. I don't know and the boss made it extra clear that I shouldn't care, so I don't. See ya. He shuffles away and leaves you to pursue the lead from the letter. Time to pay a visit to no leap. You arrive at the address mentioned in the note. Not counting local restaurant patrons, the street is mostly empty at this time of night. But curiously, the wine shop is still open. Inside, a small middle-aged woman with curly hair stands behind the counter in front of a wall filled with wine. There's a door at the back of the room with a small table and chair, occupied by a man in a black faux leather jacket with slick, combed back hair. He's reading a newspaper, but pauses as a little bell rings when you open the door. He takes a sip from a small, steaming cup, then gets back to his broadsheet. Good evening. How can I help you? I would like a bottle of the 1821 Special Reserve, please. Let me check our stock. She seems to be looking through a database on the laptop sitting on the counter. She puts on a polite smile. Afraid we don't have that one at the moment. Sorry. Uh, sorry. He said the phrase. Uh, in that case, let me see if we have any in the back. Wait here, please. The woman leaves the counter and goes through the doors in the back. The man by the table puts down his newspaper and takes another sip from the cup, washing it down with a gulp of water from the nearby glass. He tries to hide it, but there's no doubt he's watching you. About a minute passes. You remind yourself of what Kaiser wrote in the letter and keep quiet, patiently waiting for the woman to return from the back of the store. A man finishes his drink and starts doodling on the newspaper, his eyes starting to you every so often. The doors, sorry, the doors to the back of the store open and the proprietor emerges with a small, unlabeled swap bottle of crimson liquid. She gives you an apologetic smile. Excuse me, sorry for taking so long. Turns out we did have it. She offers you the bottle and you reach out to grab it, but she retracts it. You do know what this is, don't you? Focus your blood and immediately see both of the people in the shop focus intently in, in on what you and I uh, focus intently in on you and what you're about to say. I know exactly what this is, and I'm the right person to give it to. The woman gives you the bottle without hesitation. Grazie. Then you've pushed your luck far enough, you nod and exit the store. You take a brisk walk to your car. Nobody follows you as you leave Nolita and drive back to your apartment. It takes some time to find a parking spot. Finally get out of the car and start looking for Jack. He's not far from where you parted ways just under two hours ago. Got the goods? I sure do. Cool. Stand by. Gotta make the call. He takes a few more steps into a narrow space between two buildings and takes out the same high-tech phone you saw him carrying last time. Hey boss, yeah they have it. Where do I point them to? Okay, yeah, I'll tell them. 
Yeah, I'll tell him to go there right away. Puts the phone back in his pocket and turns to you. Bullet point, half an hour, so you better step on it. See you around. With only a flippant salute, Jackie starts walking down the street. You make your way back to the car and drive. You had to push the speed limit to make it on time, but you're here. Bullet point is quite a change of scenery. The place is a post-industrial dump in a nearby stadium notwithstanding. You stop your car once you realize that if you go any further down, the potholes will kill your chassis. You step out onto one of those gashes in the asphalt, splashing into the ankle-deep water. Kaiser's limo is nowhere to be seen. In fact, the whole place is pretty much deserted, other than the apparent proprietor of a lonely bar, a middle-aged woman who's just locking up the place. Uh... I think with where I'm at, we'll just wait. You stay near your car and decide to wait. Kaiser must be on his way. Or if he's not, and he's instead playing one of his games, then you're not participating. You got what he wants, let him come to you. The bright lights of a car pulling over down the road some ten minutes later catches your attention. It's a black limo. Kaiser is finally here. Let's see. Same as last time. The car door opens, but nobody comes out. You know the drill. This time, Kaiser is visible when you look inside. Sit down and close the door behind you. So you pulled it off without a hitch, then. Give it here. You hand the bottle over to the Nosferatu. He uncorks it gently, takes a whiff, and puts the cork back in. Yeah, that's the stuff. I can see you're useful beyond your charm with the subtlety of a battering ram. Good to know. Here's Langley's precious address. He passes you an envelope with what feels like a thick card inside. Thank you, Mr. Kaiser. Yeah, yeah. I'll send Jackie over if I ever need anything else from you. How about that? Time for you to get out. Now. He waves you out of the car... With the envelope in hand, you get out. Back onto the torn asphalt and decrepit surroundings, the limo slowly drives away. Finally, you can return to Sophie and bring her what she wants. Gregory lets you in. You hear a shrill, you hear a shrill, unpleasant laugh, and you realize Sophie's having a guest over. Thomas Arturo, you met in the Elysium a few nights back. That shriek is unmistakable. Ah, Tehran's. So glad to see you. Tell me, did you two have a chance to talk previously? Thomas speaks up before you can. Why, yes, of course. You made such a good first imp and such a good first impression you made too. Miss Langley clearly did the right thing by taking you under his under her wing. I'm sure she thinks so too, don't you, Sophie? Why, of course I Of course you do, of course. Well, I believe I must be going. I'll be sure to let Prince Panhard know your thoughts, Miss Langley, word for word, or as close as I can remember them. I appreciate it, Thomas. You two and you two enjoy your night now. Good night, Sophie, Tehran's, Greggy boy. He gives you a sly smile. Sophie's driver opens the door for Arturo, and the guest steps out with a single wave of the hand. And the guest steps out with a single wave of the hand. Towards his host and you. The door closes. He's quite the character, isn't he? Yes, quite. But he has his uses. Thomas has clout in court. Access to many juicy details on everyone from the prince to the lowliest primogen. It's useful to have him on your side, even if his eccentricity requires some patience. Speaking of patience... You have been putting mine to the test lately. Did you manage to contact Kaiser and acquire what I asked for? Yes. Uh, sorry, I just completely lost my voice for a second. Yes, I have. 
but the data you offered was old news to him. I had to do another job for him before he would give me this card. She retrieves the envelope. I'm sure he did. I hope it wasn't too much of an inconvenience. He's got a servant named Jack. He was a pain to deal with. I hear all of his ghouls are like that. The apple never falls far from the tree, it would seem. You open, She opens the envelope and you look at the card. You notice the same lettering you saw on Kaiser's note from before. You can't see the details. Her eyes widen. Yes, excellent. I need to call in some favors. I will likely be busy for the next few nights. You have my permission to so, show some initiative, my dear charge. I will contact you soon. With that, Sophie ushers you outside and you are left to do with the rest of this night's hours as you like. Um. I think I'm going to keep going with this. As you open the blinds, you're able to spot a small grayish bird flying off into the night. Looking down, you notice a small piece of paper on the windowsill. Prospect. ASAP. 10. Third time's the charm, you think to yourself, as once again you cross the gate of Prospect Park and head for Tamika's Haven. To your surprise, you find her out in the open, sitting on the lawn surrounded by a host of woodland creatures, mostly birds and, birds and squirrels, mostly. The critters each patiently await their turn as she flicks seeds at them. It almost looks whimsical in a twisted sort of way. Hey, you wanted to see me? Yeah, I did. She scares the remaining seed onto the grass and hops to her feet. I've been doing some digging. The Inquisition has a safe house up in Manhattan. I think that where they're keeping him. The scarred one, I mean. I want to pay them a visit. Kill that thing and as many of those SI bastards as I can along the way. Attacking a government safe house? Correct me if I'm wrong. Wouldn't that be considered a breach of the masquerade? Yeah, and that's the least of our worries. Throw in a legion of armed goons standing in the our way, and an all-powerful vampire as the cherry on top. Look, I'm not stupid. I know it's risky as hell, and I'm well aware I might not be coming back. Still, I think it's something I have to do, with or without your help. Oh, what the hell. Who wants to live forever, right? I'm in. Me too. He emerges from the shadow a mere few feet away. Son of a gun family... Finally managed to sneak up on him. Tamika eyeballs him as he gets closer. You've seen her you've seen that look before. She's clearly assessing her she's clearly asserting her position. But this time it comes off as a formality rather than an actual challenge. How long have you been there, Ra Raul? Long enough. I'm not buying that whole scarred one bullcrap, but taking a bite out of the Inquisition's collective ass is just too good to pass up. I want it. Call it the scarred one, Santa, or the tooth fairy. Just know that it's very real and very dangerous. Ugh, fine. Consider me fairly warned. Now we can move this. Can we move this along? I'm itching to kill some. Kill me some SI fucks. Tamika, you got an opinion? Hey. Guess I know who the alpha around here is. You should come with us. He's got the right to be there. To see the scarred one with his own eyes. Plus, my brother can be in 
Plus, my brother can be a pain in the ass, but he's one hell of a fighter. There you go. Ham seal of approval. It's settled then. Let's go. Fucking fine. And with that, you leave the relative safety of Prospect Park, stealing yourself for things to come. As you get closer to your destination, you get the sneaking suspicion that Tamika's been pulling your leg. Following her lead, you take a turn from Broadway into Fort Tryon Park. Doesn't It doesn't seem to make sense, you think to yourself. There's only one spot between here and the Hudson River, but it can't be. Can it? Sure enough, as a stone facade... Of the cloisters comes into view, Tamika motions at you to keep out of sight. How the hell is this well-known tourist trap a hideout for the Second Inquisition? The cloister? Seriously? That's the Inquisition safe house? Talk about hiding in plain sight, huh? This place used to be a lot of things. Now it serves as a staging ground for the Inquisition. If my sources are to be trusted... And they usually are. They brought him here for what they call processing. Don't they'll keep him here for long, though. If we want to get him, it's now or never. As if on cue, a group of armed guards walks out of the museum, pushing a gurney with a large steel container on the on top of it. As they wheel it out to the open, a truck approaches. The operatives start preparing to load the crate onto the vehicle. You scan the area, trying to take a head count. Tamika beats you to it. I got at least seven, probably more inside. We should do this quietly and take him out one by one. Raul frowns. I say we go in guns blazing, figuratively speaking. If there's more inside, let them come. The more, the merrier. Tamika's... <clears throat> Tamika's right. We should get in quietly, take them out one by one. Tamika nods in silence. Uh, fine. Let's do this already before you two bore me to final death. You split up, aiming to cover as much ground as possible. Sticking to the shadows, you advance, keeping track of one another's progress. You hardly even notice as Tamika takes out the first guard. Now keep out of it. Trying to keep up, Raul kills the one on your left. He slop takes a sweet ass time bleeding the guy up. With his dying breath, the man lets out a yelp, drawing the attention of one of his comrades. With the guard fast approaching, you ponder your options. As the guard walks by, you leap out of the shadows and put him in a crushing headlock, opting for a non-lethal approach to quickly choke the guy out. Just as you're about to move on, Raul jumps in and plunges his claws into the man's chest. He then turns towards you and mutters a silent reprimand. So I chose that option because I thought I would, you know, choke him to death, not just like put him out non-lethal. No witnesses. Three down, four to go. Keep a steady pace, moving across the courtyard, picking off the guards one by one. Mika does her part, three to go. Raul gets messy again. At least this time, he's quiet. With only two of them left, you pick one for yourself and gesture at one of your fellow ferals to take the other out. Mika's quieter, but Raul's closer. Which one will you choose? You wave your hand at Tam, pointing at her final target. She nods and starts making her way towards him. Suddenly, by virtue of sheer luck, he turns around as she's about to pounce. His scream is quickly muffled, but still loud enough for the very last guard. As all three of you approach him, the dire reality of the situation hits him like a ton of bricks. 
Paralyzed with fear, he keeps shifting his aim from you to Tamika to Raul. He's, he's severely fucked and he knows it. And since you're standing closest to him, you might as well do the honors. Uh, I will... You walk over to the quivering mess that mere minutes ago thought himself the toughest of the tough. Before he can react, you slap the gun out of his hands, lean in and smile. Hi. A second later, your fangs are already halfway to his windpipe. Blood tastes sour with a hint of cowardice and regret. Could have gone out with a bang, chose to go out with a gurk. Oh well. With the SI operatives taken care of, you turn your attention to the container sitting in the middle of the courtyard. Using your combined strength, you make quick work of the steel door. As you walk in, the moonlight from behind illuminates a twisted figure huddle on the floor. It's hard to believe that the thing lying before you, beaten and tortured within an inch of its own life, is the same creature you fought back at the cemetery. What the fuck is that thing? It's what happens when you lose it, when you let the beast take over. His lips move silent, as if searching for the right words. He looks to you, then to his sister, as if waiting for a sign. For a moment, to me, it just stands there. She looks down at the scarred one, the once fearful boogeyman whose very mention could strike terror in the hearts of her tribe, now reduced to a whimpering pile of flesh. Finally, she turns to you with a look of childish innocence mixed with confusion, and she looks back at the scarred one and tells she's lost. Tam, what the hell are you waiting for? Let's kill this thing and get out of here. Ooh, what do I do? Um, are you sure that's what you want? Look at him. As if he's already dead and always that matter. And are you fucking kidding me? We came all this way just to back down now. Stop talking. She's quivering, clenching her fists. You can tell she's about to reach a decision. Look at him, Tim. There's barely anything left. Is he really worth it? Suddenly, the very air around you seems to thick. You look over it. You look over to Tam. To Tamika. She's not quivering anymore. She looks down at the mess of flesh and fur curled on the steel floor. Her voice is calm and quiet. No, he isn't. Both turn to walk away when suddenly you hear a pained yelp, followed by the sound of a body dropping to the ground. You turn back to see Raul standing over the dead husk of what was once the mighty scarred one. In one fluid motion, the boogeyman's neck has whisked off his shoulders. Raul, I... You had your shot, sister. I took it for you. I hope you don't come to regret this. Standing outside the steel container, the three of you take a moment to gather your thoughts. You look at one another, at the blood staining your hands, clothes, and faces. Hands, clothes, and faces. In the pale moonlight, it appears black and shiny, like a fresh ink stain on a fresh sheet of paper. Without another word, you head back towards the city lights. The journey back takes longer than it did in the other direction. With bits and pieces of the second inquisition still stuck to your clothes, you decide to play it safe by sticking to back alleys and cutting through the darker corners of the city. Tamika stays several steps ahead. Both you and Raul are quite content to leave. Stay behind. You can tell these last few nights have taken a toll on her, not necessarily in a bad way. She seems stronger, somehow confident, 
more in tune with yourself. Soon the awkward silence proves unbearable enough that you're willing to risk making small talk with Raul. You know, I'm still not sure I understand what happened. Back there. You would. <clears throat> it's not something one of your lineage could understand. Our lineage, we have a special relationship with the beast. We can either let it control us or become attuned to it. It's a constant struggle, marked with difficult choices. I think Tam made just made one of them, and so did I. Pondering what you've heard, pondering what you've heard, the rest of the trip barely registers. To your, to your surprise, you suddenly find yourself back at the prospect. Tamika keeps walking. She strides through the park gate like the queen of all, turning after a victorious conquest. You want to call out to her, but Raul, Raul stops you with a gesture. Not yet. Give her some time to process all the shit. She'll let you know when she's ready. And hey, you did all right. Don't get me wrong. You're still an asshole. But yeah, thanks. He smiles to you. Wonders never cease. See you around. And with that, he follows his sister's footsteps. A weird smile creeps onto your face as you meld into the New York night. All right. Well, this seems like a good place to call it. Like to thank you all for watching, and I will see you all with more coteries of New York.